Quickly assimilating these influences, holed up in the backwater isolation of Hell House, Van Zant and the band began developing their own material. Let's say Gary Rogers and Alan went home and were just picking around on their guitars. We'd practice all day. they go home and clean up, play guitar. And I uh, practice. And, well, they get into a groove with something really cool, you know, that's a whole measure. You know, and a whole measure so it could be a song. Even when a chorus of them sometime, a whole song right there. And if the band liked it, and if Ronnie could dig it and put some words to it, we'd keep it. Ronnie never wrote down one word to any song. If that don't freak y'all out, I don't know. Nobody's ever done that. And they ask uh, intricate songs. And they'd ask him, Ronnie, why don't you write it down? And he'd say, look, if it ain't worth remembering, it ain't no good. With a clutch of self-penned tracks now in their arsenal, in May 1969, the 1% were offered their first stab at recording. Local manager David Griffin, keen to capture the best of the up-and-coming Jacksonville acts on vinyl, booked both Van Zant's band and Larry Steele's new ensemble, Black Bear Angel, into Norm Vincent Studios to produce two promotional singles for Shade Tree Records. David Griffin was the one that set up the studio time for 1% and Black Bear Angel. My band wasted time, Ronnie's did not. Ronnie went in there, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He took advantage of the situation. They put down two songs, and the next thing you know, he had TV exposure, a lot of airplay and stuff like that. That was a, a big thing to their career. It's been so long since I've been gone. Lord, I'm sad now. Those were the days I enjoyed the most. Need all my friends. That was the first really professional one we just really grooved on, you know. Everybody liked it, the crowd, and our friends, and we liked it. Yeah, that one was for a good time. Them songs brought us joy, you know. Mm -hmm. 